Welcome to another short lecture uh, from chapter two in your textbook. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the drawbacks of, of mediated communication. So we find, uh, studies find that, that um, mediated communication is not as satisfying as face-to-face -face communication. Uh, this is, at least in part, related to a, a concept known as Dunbar's number. So Dunbar was a social scientist who, who studied friendships and acquaintances and these kinds of things in an effort to try and figure out how, how many good friends and, 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 and acquaintances and so on can we have? What kinds of relationships can we have and how many of them can we sustain? And what he figured out through, through much testing and, and much, much survey was that you could only sustain about 150 relationships at any one time. So this means, out of this 150, you have about five core relationships. Now, this would be things like husband, uh, children, mother, father, right? Maybe brother, sister, depending on how close you are to your siblings. You could have about 10 to 15 close friends, right? So, so you know, these are people that, that you interact with on a regular basis, that you feel very close to. And then you can sustain about another 35 reasonably strong contacts. Now, these are people that you might see when you go to class or, or, or you go to work, right? And, and you feel like you know them, but they're probably not your best friend. They might not, I mean, maybe half of them will get invited to your birthday party, but, you know, probably not the rest of them. That leaves about 100 other people to round out, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> your group of meaningful connections. And you really can't manage more. That other 100 people are people that you just know, like the guy at the dry cleaner or the waitress that takes your order every day at Waffle House, right? People that you know, but you don't really know. People that you have impersonal kinds of relationships with. So with that in mind, I, I want to ask you, how many Facebook friends do you have, right? I know people with 500, 600 friends. I know people on Instagram with thousands and thousands of followers. So even if you have a million followers on Instagram, you probably only maintain decently close ties to about 150 or less. We really can't manage any more. Indeed, we find that lots and lots of Facebook followers can be equated with low self-esteem. So I, I, the idea here is that you're, you're, you want people to like you so much that, that you're desperate to try and keep everybody happy and, and, and manage more than, than Dunbar's number of 150. And the truth is that once you get past 150, it's, it's really not rewarding anymore. Right? It's, it's, uh, it really just doesn't work. So one thing that we find is that lonely people can exhibit a preference for online social interaction. So in a way, this can lead to increased levels of loneliness. Now, I've always wondered about this from a social science perspective, right? Because it seems, the logic here seems kind of suspect to me. As your book tells us, again, lonely people can exhibit a preference for online social interaction. And, and of course, this makes sense, but, uh, I mean, would it be the case that, that you know, even though these people are, are engaging with others exclusively online in many instances, does that mean, for example, that they wouldn't engage with those people at all without the Internet? Would they be even lonelier, in other words, without the Internet? I'm not sure. But we find that, that people who are apprehensive about face-to-face -face communication uh, feel better about communicating online, oftentimes because they're able to edit their thoughts. Uh, and, the, and in some cases, they create entirely different identities online, right? I mean, that is, at least in part, the, the beauty of the anonymity of the Internet, that you can be whoever you want to be online. And sometimes it's easier for some people not to be themselves. We also find that positive feedback online really leads to a greater sense of self-efficacy, right? So, so we, you know, in other words, people feel like they're, they're capable of doing more or doing better when they get positive feedback online. So that's, that's one of the benefits of online communication, right? But this can also lead to people feeling more respected and important online. So, so, for example, if you've created a false identity for yourself, if you enjoy pretending you're someone else online, and you get lots of, of, of feedback for that, you might want to be that online person all the time. Or at least that's the way the thinking goes. And so this can lead to increased dependence on and desire for exclusively online interpersonal interaction. So you spend all your time online and very little time interacting in the real world. 
Now, one of the things your book indicates, again, uh, and something that I'm a little wary of, is that people who spend excessive time on the internet may begin to experience problems at school or work. Uh, they can withdraw from, from offline relationships, right? They can withdraw from face-to-face -face relationships and concentrate all their time on these online relationships. And this can, in turn, cause problems at school or work. Now, I, I have no doubt that this can happen, but I don't know if, if we should attribute it to, to the digitally mediated nature of this communication. I mean, the truth is, if you do anything excessively, it can cause you problems at school or work. If you're a star basketball player and you spend all your time practicing and none of your time doing homework, you're going to have problems at school, right? If you like to drink and party a lot and you spend all your time partying, that's going to cause problems at school or work eventually, right? So I, I want you when, you, when you read something like this, I mean, this is true, but at the same time, I want you to, to think about, is it really the, the nature of online communication that causes this problem? Or is it just that anything done too much can, can cause problems? Ultimately, the link between social awkwardness, shyness, and, and related feelings of inferiority and the Internet are, are not really well understood. Right? We, bottom line is we don't know if people are socially awkward because they spend too much time on the Internet or if they spend too much time on the Internet because they're already socially awkward. Again, Social science really hasn't figured out the answer to this. We don't know. But if I had to put money down on it, I'd bet that people spend too much time on the Internet because they're already socially awkward, right? I don't think the Internet makes us socially awkward. But that's just my opinion. We know that there is a connection between heavy social media usage and relationship problems. We know, for example, uh, a study uh, recently has shown that people who use Facebook more than once an hour are more likely to experience Facebook-related conflict with their romantic partners. So that's, uh, you know, why are you always looking at your phone? You're always on Facebook. You're always on Instagram. You're always, right? That, that complaint. And, and we know now that, that recently, as recently as two years ago, Facebook's being cited as a reason for up to one-third of all divorces. Right? So, so Facebook is beginning to give money a, a, a challenge for the spot soon for, for the number one reason why people get divorced. We know that the mere presence of mobile devices can have a negative impact on closeness. So if you want to feel close with your boyfriend or girlfriend, do yourself a favor and put your phone away for a little while. We also know that Facebook use is a significant predictor of divorce rate and marital troubles. So social scientists can look at you figure out how much time you're spending on Facebook, how much time you're spending on Instagram, and so on. And they can figure out, with a certain degree of accuracy, whether or not you're likely to get divorced, right? Or what the percentage chance is of that. So something to think about when you engage in your face-to-face -face relationships. All right, so let's watch this, this quick video here uh, about divorce and social media. Uh, here we go. Back to ABC 15 now, is social media ruining real relationships? According to ABC News, a third of all divorce filings last year contained the word Facebook. That number was 20% just three years ago. Many of the references have to do with spouses sending inappropriate messages to Facebook friends. Others have to do with people saying nasty things about their significant others on the social media site. So we want to know what you think. Do you think social media is ending marriages that would have survived if it didn't exist, or is it just speeding along the inevitable? And our guest today is former WNBA player Katie Christensen. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. These topics are quite interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like everyone, man or woman, has uh, some experience with Facebook causing a problem. Well, I think, I, I mean, you're blaming Facebook on something right now. I think that there's a much larger problem. There's an issue. Uh, marriage is hard enough as it is. Then you have technology, period. I mean, how many people have questioned whether their significant other, they want to look at their phone, but can they look at their phone? And that's not even just, you know, it's text messaging, voicemails, emails, Facebook. Um, I think that if there's people out there that are having Facebook affairs, that it's they would do it regardless of Facebook. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. If you're going to cheat, you're going to cheat. Yeah. I mean, Facebook may be just maybe the tool right. to kind of get you there quicker, but if you have that in you to instinctively cheat, you're going to do it whether it's on Facebook well, or I whether you're just out. People probably think that it just gives you an opportunity to get in touch with people that maybe 
it wouldn't have been as easy to cheat at, at that point. But seriously, if it's not that person, then it's going to be somebody else anyway, whether it's an old flame or someone you know from high school or college or whatever, it doesn't matter. The larger picture is just that um, there's problems in people's marriages, period, and Facebook really yeah. is not to blame for it. Yeah. No, no kidding. I, I agree with you. If you're going to cheat, you're going to cheat. Mm -hmm. It's just technology, like you mentioned, whether it's Facebook or cell phones, whatnot. It just makes it, it facilitates Well, I think it's process. easier to catch people right. that way That's because true. there's a trail. Like, people forget that the Internet, once it's out there, it's out there. And, um, you know, protecting your passwords and all this mm -hmm. stuff. Like, if you have a spouse that has access to this stuff, it's your fault if you're that stupid. Mm -hmm. You're going to get caught. And you guys are certainly <laughs> agreeing with this on Facebook. Jennifer Creasy Turner says, your marriage was already doomed if Facebook seemed to be the cause. Yeah. All right, so uh, one of the things that, that we find uh, that's fairly common with regard to social media is deception or misrepresentation, right? We know, for example, uh, that on dating sites, uh, a huge percentage of, of women lie about their weight and, and an even larger percentage of men lie about their height, for example, right? Uh, it's be also become common practice recently for people to put fake jobs or uh, um, you know, sort of pumped up job titles on, on their LinkedIn pages, right? So these are, these are examples of very common kinds of online deception. Another drawback to mediated communication is stalking and harassment, right? Um, your book uh, talks about online surveillance, right? And this is something that probably most of you have done, right? So online surveillance, according to your book, is monitoring the social activities of, of people who don't know you're doing it, right? through uh, Facebook, Instagram, and so on, right? So when you look up that old boyfriend or girlfriend on Facebook or Instagram to see what they're doing, right, you're, you're performing online surveillance. Now, you know, typically this is, isn't that bad. However, it can escalate into cyber stalking, right? Um, and unfortunately, guys, that's usually done by us, right, typically males uh, who are stalking ex-girlfriends. Uh, and uh, I should note too, if it's happening to you, you should let the police know, right? And maybe think about getting off social media for a while. Uh, one final drawback that's worth talking about with regard to social media is cyberbullying, right? The, the aggressive harassing of victims online, often in public forums. We know that, that four out of 10 teens report having been cyberbullied and, and the results can be really negative, right? Uh, it can, at times, and it's in its, uh, you know, uh, most hurtful forms lead people to suicide. Uh, we, we know that it's more common in middle school than, than in high school and later in life. Uh, and we know that it can also result in other negative consequences, including depression, uh, bad performance at school, drug and alcohol abuse, right? And so uh, cyberbullying has really become uh, an important focus for, for a lot of uh, middle school and, and, and high school administrators now. All right, so that does it for today, and thanks for checking out my short video.